In this video, we are going to take a look at the interrupts and how they are managed. So first of all, let's see what a modern general purpose computer system consists of and how do they handle the interrupts. So we have a central processing unit or the processor which is connected to other components like the secondary storage, the input devices like the mouse and the keyboard, the output devices like the monitor and a shared memory by means of a bus. And this bus provides the access between all the components and the shared memory. Each of these devices over here, the input output devices, the secondary storage and the memory, each of these they are managed by a device which is known as a controller. So for the disks, we would have a disk controller. For the input devices, they would be handled by the USB controller and so on. Apart from the controller, there is a specific program which is known as the device driver and there is a device driver for each kind of device controller. So suppose if we have a hard disk and we have a disk controller for this, this disk controller would be having some local buffer storage and it would be having a set of registers. For this disk controller, there would be a specific program which would be known as the device driver. This device driver, it understands the device controller and provides the OS, which is the operating system, a means to communicate with the disk controller. So this device driver is an abstraction for the OS to handle the disk controller. The CPU and the device controllers, they can execute concurrently. That means they will compete for memory cycles. The CPU, because it is executing programs, it also needs to access the memory. The disk controller, because it needs to transfer data and if it is using direct memory access, it also needs to communicate with the memory and they will uh, be managed by the memory controller which is handling the memory. Now any time any component like an input output device, it wants to communicate with the system, it will send an interrupt. So the hardware may trigger an interrupt at any time by sending a signal to the CPU. So this hardware will send a signal to the CPU through the system bus. Now whatever task the CPU was doing. So if it was executing an instruction, it will complete that particular instruction and then stop the task and transfer the execution to the starting address where the service routine for the interrupt is located. That means each kind of interrupt that is received by the CPU is handled by a particular routine which is known as the interrupt service routine and for this now the CPU will start running this routine to take care of the interrupt that has been received. After this interrupt service routine has been executed then the CPU will resume whatever task it had stopped and it will start running that task again. So for each different kind of interrupt that is received by the CPU, there is a specific interrupt service routine that will execute. So if the type of interrupt has been received by a disk or the type of interrupt that has been received by a network line, so each different kind of interrupt that is received will be dealt by, with differently by the CPU. So if the uh, any device wants to start an input output operation, the device driver which was the program which was managing the disk controller was communicating with the disk controller. This device driver will load the appropriate registers in the device controller. Now the device, the controller will examine the contents of the registers 
to determine what kind of an action is to be taken. That means is it a read or a write, how much uh, data, what is the size of the data to be transferred, what will be the starting address in the memory where that data has to be read or written from. So all of this information the device driver has loaded into the registers. After reading and determining what kind of action is to be taken, now the controller will start the transfer of data from the device to its local buffer. So suppose if it is a read operation then from the disk the data will be transferred onto this local buffer. When the data has been transferred into the local buffer then it will be uh, given control of the memory for the direct memory access and after this complete transfer of data has taken place now the device driver will again inform the OS that it has finished its task that whatever data was to be transferred from the device has that transfer has taken place and now the device driver will give the control back to the operating system. The operating system will now start the task which was initially interrupted by the CPU and the CPU will resume its previous task. Now let us see how the interrupt service routines are stored in the memory and how they are accessed. So there is a table of pointers which is referred to as the interrupt vector table and this table of pointers it points to the interrupt routines. As we specified earlier these interrupt routines they are programs or softwares or modules which will handle the particular kind of interrupt that has been received. So suppose if this is a memory and this is the table interrupt vector table and for each different kind of interrupt it is maintaining the interrupt vectors that means it is storing the addresses of the different interrupt service routines. So suppose the uh, address is 200 so at address 200 that there, there is an interrupt service routine for a particular kind of device. At address 300 so 300 is the interrupt vector at address 300 there is another interrupt service routine which is for another kind of uh, device. So this table of pointers is pointing to the different interrupt routines and the locations in this table they are holding the addresses. These addresses are known as interrupt vector. So 200, 300, 400 these are all interrupt vectors and they are pointing to the addresses of the interrupt service routines for the various devices. Whenever the CPU detects a signal on the interrupt request line because whenever the device wants to communicate it sends a signal to the CPU along with a number. It will send the so the device will send an interrupt number along with the interrupt signal. So this CPU will read the interrupt number and use this interrupt number to index into the vector table. So suppose the number that was received by the CPU from the device is let's say 2. So then this 2 will be used to index into the table. So this is 0, 1 and 2. So 2 would be used to index in this table of interrupt vector and from 400 so wherever the address 400 is whatever is the interrupt service routine over there that routine will be run by the CPU now to handle that particular routine. So once the CPU reads the interrupt number, it will use the interrupt number to index into the table and start execution at the address associated with that index. But before that interrupt service routine will run, this interrupt handler must save the current state of the task that has been interrupted. So CPU was already running a program. Now the state of that particular program has to be saved before the CPU can start running the ISR. Once the interrupt has been serviced, the return address of the previous task 
will be loaded back into the program counter and the task which was interrupted will be resumed. Apart from the interrupts that are received from the hardware devices, there are another kind of uh, 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 signals which are sent by software and these are known as traps. These are software generated interrupts and they are caused either if there is an error in the program like a divide by zero or an invalid memory access or there is a specific request from a user program if it wants any operating system service and this is through a system call. So we can have the interrupts from the hardware devices or we can have these software generated interrupts which are referred to as traps.